Our symptoms are born out of emotional denial and they serve to maintain that denial. They are always that we allow ourselves to live one kind of life while convincing ourselves that we have a very different kind of life. Ooh, we, you hear that? They are all, they, they are ways that we allow ourselves to live one kind of life while convincing ourselves that we have a different kind of life. And while they serve to give us the illusion that we are in control, they are in fact clear indicators that we have something that we have really done is to give up healthy control of our lives to something outside of ourselves. By becoming trapped in an addiction or a phobia, we actually trade true control over our lives for the illusion of control. It is this illusion of control that makes giving up our symptoms so frightening. The sex addict truly and sincerely believes that he or she gives up unhealthy sex, life will crumble, and they will be in chaos. The relationship addict, most often addicted to a person who is himself an addict, sincerely believes that if he or she tries to change in healthy ways, life will fall apart. The exercise bulimic who keeps his weight under control by running, who finds his only sense of pseudo inner peace by running, and who shows all signs of withdrawal when he isn't able to run, truly and sincerely believes that his life will not be worth living without the ability to run. Our symptoms all started out as normal, as a normal response to some perceived life stress. It is our opinion that the breeding ground for them was introduced in childhood when we were learning how to live with other people. When those family symptoms in which we grew up had some kind of dysfunction in it, whether it was obvious, overt, or if it was in Sandy's case, a subtle covert, or as it was um, in Frank's case, it is normal, logical, and reasonable for a child in that family to protect himself or herself. Just as the physical body will isolate an infection and protect the rest of the body from creating a cyst around it, if it is left untreated for too long, our childhood minds will isolate the source of psychological pain in a safe blanket of denial to maintain some type of balance. These symptoms form as a, as a, a way of protecting us from pain. Because as children, we didn't have any power to remove. From the early beginnings of denial grows a pattern of splitting ourselves into like almost two people. Like Sandy did. She was competent, high achieving um, on the outside and a frightened, hurt little lost child in the inside. The longer this dysfunction went untreated, the more adept she became to deny it and her true feelings. And the more we deny our feelings, the worse we feel. And so our symptoms are about the denial of the feelings too. We shut off the hurt and the fear. We bask in the praise of outsiders who can only see the public image that we want to present. We take pride in being the strong one or the rebel or the cutie pie. And all while we are dying inside because we feel that no one really knows who we are. And they probably don't. Thus, our symptoms are also intimacy or relationship disorders. Oh, yeah, I know. I know this is what you know makes it real for most of us when we finally come to the realization that that is what we're doing in our lives and then that 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 crap is crazy i'm just trying to tell you it, it's crazy by supporting our denial and by helping us to maintain our family secrets they also keep us from ever getting close to anyone else in healthy ways 
We always have to keep our guard up in the hopes that no one will find out what's really inside, which means that our symptoms are also about shame. They are about the shame of being found out. The shame of being discovered. Of being emotionally naked in front of others and being laughed at, criticized, or rejected. The list of symptoms that can develop in an adult children in, of dysfunctional families is quite long. And in many of us, there are several of these present at the same time. We have never met a compulsive overeater, for example, who does not have an unhealthy dependency for food. We have rarely seen a spouse of an alcoholic who is not literally addicted to the relationship with their spouse, who is not compulsive in several other areas of life, and who does not have an unhealthy dependency on other people or things, and who does not have problems with depression. Okay? Those are, those, those are the symptoms, you know, of a person that's, you know, attracting and they're with an alcoholic. Okay? They, they, they kind of like go together. Hope I'm being clear. Um, Cause a lot of y'all want to push back and be like, "What are you the hell are you talking about?" I know, cause you'll send me an email, or you'll make a comment below, and it'll take me a while to get to them because, of course, I have to approve the comments because some of y'all are so rude. <laughs> y'all so rude. But anyway, and not in my house will you talk that way. Anyway. It is not the label one puts on people that determines what kind of family problems they will have or what kind of parents they will make. It doesn't matter to the child whimpering in her bedroom after being screamed at by her frustrated, lonely mother whether or not her mother is labeled a relationship addict, a codependent, or a compulsive overeater. What matters to the child is that the fact mom and dad aren't happy and mom and dad scream at her all the time and mom and dad put her in the middle of their fights and that mom and dad won't let her feel her real feelings. And I thought about that, you know, and, um, uh, and in terms of my parenting, um, those are the things that brought up the light in my in myself I thought about things like um, you know how many times have I hollered at my child and it wasn't my child's fault I was frustrated about something totally different and that child doesn't know the difference and they're so wounded just by thinking that they disappointed me and hopefully I'm making a difference and doing different things different now that I'm the grand but it's 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 something that you have to be cognitive of because if you're not, you if you don't, you'll repeat the same patterns. If my grandbaby hears me fussing, she'll already feel upset, and she'll come right away and she want to know, are you up, my granny? You upset? Are you angry? Um, and I have to, I find, I make it my responsibility to stop her and say, listen, no. Granny is not upset at you. I'm a little frustrated because the dog ate up the shoe or whatever it is that it is. I have to assure her in no uncertain terms um, and that I have to be apologetic because I have no right to really, really put that energy in the atmosphere when it really has nothing to do with her. Okay? And so, but if I'm not cognitive of that, then look how much, how many times of a day we go on through the day yelling and fussing and with children in the house how that impacts their vibratory environment is something that we have to be mindful and cognitive of we really do <laughs>